we've um, well involved in schools in the education system. So on that um, website, it's teaching or it's um, resources for teachers to use for children between the age of seven and fifteen. And it says pilgrimage is a sacred, um, usually a long journey to a holy place, or which is undertaken for a spiritual purpose. A purpose. So in lecture of instruction, um, uh, text nine, it's mentioned that um, the holy places we go to holy places because they pass past time places. And Mani Bhanda Prabhu was giving the class the other day and he was mentioning how, um, when the question was asked, how can we um, remain in this consciousness or purify our consciousness and remain in the consciousness that we are living in a holy place. Because uh, even though we know that Vrindavan, Mayapur, and many Jagannathpuri, there's many holy places, but Prabhupada created the holy places in the West. So this temple is a holy place, it's a place of pilgrimage. So we go to that place because we remember the pastimes of the Lord. So Prabhupada mentions in the book that there are many temples at Madhusudana, Bhattasati. So we have Radha Bhattasati in uh, India also, and here we have Radha Gopadindani. So we remember the pastimes. Radha Bhattasati is when Krishna took the chariot um, for Arjuna and he was showing his um, great mercy and kindness and that he's the supreme lord but he took the position of a charioteer which is not a very high position just for his dear friend Arjuna and here we have another Govardhandari so the pastime is uh, we remember is Krishna lifting Govardhan here and how he saved the inhabitants of Vrindavan so in that same website, it says pilgrims are, uh, so people who go to a pilgrimage place are called pilgrims. And pilgrims are different from tourists. They travel for spiritual reasons, not just to relax or for fun. So we, as we all know, that when we go to Vrindavan, there's uh, Lloyd Bazaar. So Lloyd Bazaar is a, uh, place where we shop for all the items so that's not our main purpose of going there and uh, buying things or for relaxing or having fun shopping and things like that our main purpose of going to a holy place is to visit the holy places and how do we visit the holy place not like a tourist we go with senior devotees who are living the instructions of what Shiva said so in the purple we mentioned that uh, this Vedic system of Varnashrama system. So there's this system for Devi Varnashrama. So over time this system got contaminated and people were saying because you're born in a high class black family then you are high class and because you're born in a low class family you're low class. But this system was established not by one's birth but by one's um, nature and one's activities. So if one is inclined towards um, Pramanical activities, that's like intellectual activities, then one will take up the position of a teacher or the priestly order where they will worship the Lord. And if one's nature is of the Kshatriya, which is the administrators or the warriors, they will take up the position like here we have um, Ajita Prabhu uh, managing the farm and Yadudana Prabhu managing Krishna village. So that's administrators and overseeing that everything is done properly and leading from the front and leading by example. And then we have the Vaishya, so if one is inclined towards uh, business and uh, making money, then um, and all this is connected to the Lord. So all these natures are dovetailed in service of the Lord, just like we have Raja who does who runs the shop, so that is the mercantile raising money, selling items that uh, devotees need for their service. And then we have the Shudra class, which is the working class. So sometimes this um, Shudra, sometimes people see it as a derogatory term, but it's not. If one's nature is towards even, um, it's uh, described that the arts and people like painting and that, that's also within that class, like creativity. Like builders also, they have many ornate and intricate um, like they build the temples and things like that. So that requires a skill and an art. It's not something derogatory, but it's a 
according to one's nature, one engages in that nature. And then we also have the, those are the four spiritual divisions. So we need to also um, see our own nature and then we also need to inquire from other senior devotees that these are my interests and this is what I'd like to do, what do you think um, I should do? And then the four social orders of life. So we see that the brahmachari or celibate life is when one grows up and then until roughly around the age um, of like 21, then they are um, living at the ashram of the spiritual master. So in this day and age, we don't really have many who are living in an ashram, but the principle of it is that we follow celibacy and we learn the scriptures and we prepare our consciousness. And this is the training ground where when we enter married life or Grahastha ashram, then you're able to control the senses. Because if one um, is a bachelor and is not actually a celibate, then one thinks, oh, I'll have a boyfriend, I'll have a girlfriend, and I'll change partners and have sex with this one. If it doesn't work, then move on to the next. And it actually contaminates the consciousness. And uh, there's, a, there's a science behind celibacy because it helps one to be able to withstand and overcome and navigate in the world because especially these days you know we walk out especially in the west maybe not so much in other cultures like in south america india but it's also becoming contaminated but you walk out in the street or you go to um, like service paradise is practically you know people are walking half naked and it's not that we're judging them, but because they don't have the knowledge, they're not understanding that, you know, I'm trying to attract someone to my body, but that's just the body. What is higher, even, even than other uh, in religious principles, there's um, even Christianity or whatever religion there is, there's moral codes. So even in the old days, people in the West, they didn't dress in the, um, you know, revealing clothes, the ladies don't dress showing their cleavage or, or their legs, you know, the, the point of ladies who who want to dress like that because they don't have the knowledge. They're trying to, Robert mentions in one of his translating you know, his purpose that they're trying to attract the being to the lower parts of the body, so it's for sex attraction. So this whole material world is revolving around sex um, and money. But we, this whole system of Varna, Devi Varna Shama system is to help us all come according to our nature, we engage and then we can gradually become purified and be elevated in our consciousness to progress on the path. So Prabhupada mentions um, that this human form of life is very rare. Bhagavad Gita mentions that this 8,400,000 species of life and there's this na natural law of um, karma and reincarnation. So the soul is covered by a tree body, an insect body, human body, given God, by this, and then uh, evolves gradually and in this human form of life it's a very rare opportunity where we can engage into higher questions in life because the animals also um, Prabhupada mentions in um, Prabhupada's disciples mentioned in Srimad Bhagavatam Canto 11 Chapter 9 um, Text 29 and it's talking about detachment from all that is material so it's to, it says Labda Sudulagam Idam Bhagusanga Bhakpande Manushyam Arthadam Anityam Apihadira Turnam Yadita Namadir Anurti Yavan Nihashreya Saya Vishaya Kalu Sarvatasya which means after many many births and deaths one achieves the real human form of life which although temporary affords one the opportunity to attain the highest perfection.
creation, thus a sober human being should quickly endeavor for the ultimate perfection of life as long as his body, which is always subject to death, has not fallen down and died. After all, sense gratification is available even in the most abominable species of life, whereas Krishna consciousness is possible only for a human being. So in the purport it mentions that material life is essentially means repeated birth and death. So Prabhupada mentions in Bhagavad Gita, Abramana Bhuvana Loka. So from the highest planet down to the lowest planet, even though sometimes materially we think, okay, I work hard, get a good education, go to university, amass so much money, buy a big mansion, but your bank account will gradually finish up and you have to keep working hard. So you're going up like on a Ferris wheel, going up and down, working hard, it gets finished, you have to work hard again. So we don't want to come back on this Ferris wheel in the cycle of birth and death. We have to go through a baby's body, you know, having, going through school, you know, either being some people being bullied or being the bully or going through all those mental stuff and uh, suffering from the other living entities, from our own mind and from material nature, floods, fires, wars, things like that. And it also mentions in this purport that human life is a very grave or serious responsibility to get out of the cycle of birth and death. So we see, um, we hear that even very heavily the disciples of uh, Sri Prabhupada mentioned that uh, sense gratification is available even in the most abominable species. So we sometimes we see, you know, a dog is engaging in sexual activity even on the street. And then the human being thinks, oh, I can amass a lot of money and I can enjoy sex life in a big skyscraper and, uh, you know, using the intelligence for abominable ways of trying to engage in sex life and thinking, oh, I'm enjoying. But that same sense, that same degree of enjoyment that the human being thinks is getting from sex enjoyment, the dog is getting the same degree of sense enjoyment. Nothing different. But the human being thinks, oh, I'll try to have a polished way of sense gratification of eating, sleeping, mating and defending. But this is going on even in the animal species, insects, you know, the lowest uh, species. So we understand that we, when we read Bhagavad Gita as it is, Prabhupada mentioned especially in the um, um, Bhagavad Gita chapter 2, um, contents of the Gita summarized, it talks about the soul, that we are spirit soul and we're covered by this body, so being a human body, a male body or female body, this, the soul is um, also covered by a tree body and insect body. But when we go back to the spiritual world, we have an eternal form. Just like Prabhupada mentions in Bhagavad Gita that whatever is in this material world is a perverted reflection from what is actually in the spiritual world. So in the spiritual world, it's not just a puff of smoke and you know, everything is good, uh, you know, very, very, these descriptions of what is there in the spiritual world, we also have a form, but that form is the soul, the individual person is that spiritual body. But right now, we are the eternal spirit soul, but we're covered by this temporary material body, which is perishable, and which will die. But in the spiritual world, when we get a body, we attain that form of eternality, bliss, and um, all knowledge. Because we all, it's all centered around Krishna and pleasing Krishna and Krishna's senses. So in Bhagavad Gita, chapter 16, it talks about the divine and demonic natures and in the text 11 to 12, Popa mentions in the purple that in the demonic mentality, so Bhaktivedanta Swami and also Radhanam Swami, they give the analogy of uh, two dogs. So in Kali Yuga, we also have this uh, demon and the demigod within our own heart. So there's the good dog.
dog and the bad dog. So who wins, you know, the lower propensities, the bad dog or the good dog, you know, the higher propensities. It's the one that we feed the most. So proper mentioned in the purple that plans for life are never finished or sense gratification. And for the demonic mentality, the aim of life, the primary necessity of human life is to try to attain as much as possible, to amass as much as possible for sense gratification. And we also hear from Bhagavad Gita that the super soul Krishna is in our heart and the analogy is given like a tree. There's a tree like out there we sometimes also see the parrots coming on. So there's a green tree and there's two green parrots. So one is representing Krishna who is the super soul, who is witnessing the spirit soul trying to enjoy the fruits from the branch of the tree. But he's just witnessing. And then if we don't turn to Krishna, then whatever is due to us, we work hard, then karmically we will get good results and if we do something bad, we get bad results. But even doing good activities is binding unless it's connected to Krishna. So karma yoga is the difference between karma, which is just doing good, bad and getting the, the cycle over and over. But karma yoga is connecting that to Krishna. So there's bhakti yoga and karma yoga. But karma yoga is for one who can't fully take to the process of bhakti yoga. So there's a spiritual ladders given that if you can't do this, then do this and actually build up. Just like a child is trying to walk and the baby is trying to walk and falls down and starts bleeding, gets bruises. But then no one discourages that child. The child gets up and everyone encourages and keeps walking. Gradually, gradually the child will start walking, walking fast and even running. So it's a gradual process, but one has to also not jump um, ahead thinking that, oh, I can start doing this before one is qualified. So one has to also see one's adhika or one's uh, gift that Krishna has given and then engage that in Krishna's service and with, as to the degree of our surrender to Krishna, to that degree Krishna empowers us to be able to do more and more. Because if we look at ourselves, we are very insignificant. What can we do? What can we achieve? So in the book also, um, Devaki Mataji, she mentioned in her book about the false ego that we all gifted with some skills and we all have borrowed plumes. And if we start, we start thinking that I am the doer and I um, look at me, I am the one who did this, then Krishna can take it away. So we should always see that whenever we are able to do anything great, it's because we are getting that uh, knowledge from someone else. So we always need to. Uh, give on that credit and gratitude to our teachers and then to the, the great saints, to Sri Aurobha, to Krishna, that these are gifts given by Krishna and by His mercy I'm able to utilize it in His service. And so sometimes uh, devotees may uh, you know, appreciate and encourage and then we also say, oh, thank you and we give the credit to our spiritual master and to Krishna that at the same time, we also understand that um, it's very much an internal process. So even though externally we may be even doing our activities, doing the spiritual activities, performing our daily rituals and our sadhana, we really need to understand that we are doing this, um, we have an internal life. That I am doing this for Krishna and Krishna is giving me that empowerment. So I was listening to this um, Holy Name retreat recently, Sachinandan Swami Day, I think in New Vrindavan, and he was talking about desire. And Vaisheshika Prabhu talked about the same thing. So Sachinandan Swami mentioned desire and commitment, and Vaisheshika Prabhu mentioned desire and discipline in his success sadhana. When your, desi your desires mean discipline, so Satchinathan Swami says, oh, someone may think, oh, I desire to become a pure devotee tomorrow and then go on with their life. But, you know, as aspiring devotees, we all desire to one day go back to Krishna. But then we also need to show our commitment. 
the discipline. One, one person was actually saying, oh, I don't feel so inspired and I don't want to be, um, you know, have, be restricted to having a program. But spiritual life in Bhagavad Gita means regulation. And this regulation actually helps us. If we, are, if we think that spiritual life is just like in material life, we are regulated. We go to work and we have a work and we have a 9 to 5 job or we go to teach yoga, we committed to that and we do it. Or we get up in the morning, we committed to cleansing our body. But in spiritual life sometimes we, you know, we think that it's so cheap that oh it doesn't matter, it's accessible, I can do anything I want. Now God, Krishna is not a cheap thing that we can just do whatever and go to Him. There's clear guidelines that, okay, God, Krishna is very merciful and He says, okay, make some commitment according to where you are now. You can start by chanting, committing to one round daily, but be regulated. Don't say, oh, only when I'm inspired. Because even in a relationship, when a parent has many children, and the child shows up and is very respectful and loving, then that parent will show, you know, more attention to that child. And even though the parent loves all the children, if one child grows up and says, I want to be independent of my parent and I'll get the money and do my own business, whatever. But there's another child who works under the guidance of the parent and the parent also gives that child responsibility because he can see that he's uh, showing uh, responsibility and commitment, then there's more attention given there. So Krishna is merciful to everyone, but we need to also show our commitment to Krishna. You know, we think that in, in material life, you know, when someone um, gives a, you know, attention and we commit to a relationship, we work on the relationship. It's not that we say, oh, you, you're my, um, mother and father and they don't call you, go overseas, don't call you for 10 years and then come back and expect, you know, everything. We need to also keep in contact, you know, these exchange, loving exchanges, sending some gift, it doesn't have to be expensive, but it shows that one cares. So in spiritual life it's not something cheap, you know, we also need to show commitment. So I really appreciate it, Sajinan Swami was mentioning the difference between desire and commitment. So you're talking also about places of pilgrimage. We have the place of pilgrimage here and we are very fortunate that we have a temple here and also we have many temples around the world that Prabhupada has created. So we take this opportunity and show a commitment. It's not that, okay, we have a temple here and um, I have the facility. In the West, we're very fortunate. In India, we go there and we have to buy prashad. But here, and we go with it, we have so much opulence. You know, it's very accessible and free for everyone. But we need to show our appreciation and give back. You know, if someone is not able to commit to some service, then contribute towards buying prashad and buying boga and then cooking and distributing prashad. So all these little little things is on an individual basis. So we all have a responsibility. Whatever degree we are able to contribute, to that degree we should do and not be comfortable that, oh, I'm okay, you know, I come and do my one service a week and that's fine. No, always think like, how can I improve myself? How can I improve my service? How can I improve my sadhana? Let me try to commit to coming one day a week to the temple and do the full morning program. Or if I'm working, you know, come at least one day a week for Guru Puja or something. Always see individually how I can give more to Krishna. It's not that, okay, I live on the farm and I, I can commit to uh, maintaining my family and going out nine to five job, but I can't commit to coming to see Krishna one day a week, you know. Then that is also showing like in a relationship, you know, I go do my outside things for myself, but I'm not showing up not showing Krishna that, oh, I'm, I'm actually choosing you, Krishna. So, you know, it's, um, we see that examples that, you know, everyone has different, you know, health things or commitments and that, but we need to see our own individual life and see how I can give something more. Like, sometimes we see the, the you know, mothers, they come, even though it's hard, 
like my sister tells me, you know, when you have more than one child, getting them early, ready in the morning, kind of trying to make it to the, you know, to greetings like that. So we see sometimes the mother's come. So that is showing up for Krishna, showing that Krishna, I'm choosing you, even though it's um, an infant, just like we go to university or go to work, we get up early in the morning sometimes and have to drive out. So that is showing some commitment and going through some austerity. So when we do that for Krishna, that okay, it's really hard, but at least, you know, I'm trying Krishna, I'm showing up, then Krishna helps and he makes it easy. And if one who is within the heart, maybe life situation is different, you know, someone's health maybe they not allowing, or someone has family commitments, or needs to prepare some lunch for the husband and children going to work, but always within the heart seeing Krishna and choosing you, then Krishna will help. Definitely he helps. So I'll just um, in the I'll read the translation in the they are all, um, of text 23. There were also many other temples of various forms of the Supreme Personality of God in Krishna established by great sages and demigods. These temples were marked with the chief influence of the Buddha, and they reminded my memories of the original personality of God in Krishna. Uh, and I just remembered um, the emblems of the Lord, so every Vishnu temple has the chakra, uh, the disc on top, so it's also mentioned in Chaitanya Charita Vita how um, Haridas Thakur, he maintained the social etiquette of the society because he was born in, in a Mohammedan family, so he saw the, the chakra of the Jagannath temple and he paid the basins from a distance. So even he was not able to go, but he always had Krishna in his heart. So um, the temples are there so that you can take advantage of the temple and this human form of life is really raised like a diamond. So we can't use the diamond for cracking a nut. So that diamond is a very valuable thing. So trying to, you know, do the working and the hard to try to maintain family life. Yes, it's there, but we need to see that we have a real diamond and that diamond has to be utilized in the service of the Lord. So if anyone has any questions, comments, corrections. Yes, correct. It's in relation to the Varna system that you have mentioned. I have the impression, you know, when we look at the motives, that is, it's not really like in other yugas that you could, you can label someone as a Varna or as a Shakti or as a Shudra, etc. Because sometimes, and very often, devotees do things for Krishna and for Krishna's mission. Uh, that they're not maybe in their in their violence. For example, you can see the motives cleaning around, that doesn't mean that they're shooters. That means that he's serving the temple. Also Chaitanya he was cleaning the teacher temple. He was singing, singing according to the to the scriptures, singing and music, etc. is an activity is within Shudra category, like you said, you know, arts and everything. So I have the impression that in Kali Yuga can't really label things or activities in the same way that you may be able to label activities in other yoga because also um, being a Vaishnava, it means that you can do any single activity, like for example you see so many times the devotees are doing things, you know, uh, that maybe in other yoga they would be just sugar or would do it for Krishna. So does that mean that they're sugar or they're just doing anything? and they can't be labeled. Um, my understanding of the Varnashram system is that we need to apply for ourselves and it is still relevant because we need to engage according to our nature. Yes, and you have a valid point. At the same time, devotees do every activity. And we hear this emergency work, just like Janananda Maharaj um, and also Kadamba Kanana Swami, I think they had a plumbing problem and no one wanted to go down in the sewers. They went down, they are Brahmin and 
from nature. They went down and they cleaned all the, you know, the pool and everything. So yes, the, the devotees do everything, but to be engaged in that activity all the time is not according to our nature, then that's emergency work. So devotees step in to do emergency work. Unless one is a, on a very high platform of Krishna consciousness, then they're beyond this um, nature. But majority of us, we need to see our nature. And it's not that we're looking outside, oh, you are this, you are that. It's for ourselves that we see what nature I am. And we consult with the devotees. We also read the scriptures. So we have the threefold chip, Guru, Sadhu, and Shastra. So this system is for us to gradually progress. So we do need to see according to our nature. That your nature is more running the shop. And if someone says, no, you go and drive the, the tractor like a GT Prabhu, that's not your nature. So that you may do it emergency, like Sati did that, you know, a little bit, but it may not be her nature. So there's devotees who do many different activities, but we still need to see that we are still um, conditioned by material nature and we need to act according to our nature so we can gradually be purified. That's my understanding of it. What, what if a person, like, for example, I will never ever run a shop outside. I do it for Krishna because yeah, I'm because you that. Yeah. So that, that doesn't mean it's my nature because outside. I yes, so you are about that. So you are about that, okay? Yes, you are about being conditioned so you are doing that. So most of us, we are conditioned, so we need to act according to our nature. So what about the women that were, <coughs> are meant to be cleaning the house and serving the husband? Does that mean that all women are servants? Um, that's, uh, you know, um, controversial and people may try to push their uh, things about women's rights and things like that. But Prabhupada has given the scriptures these guidelines and sometimes through conditioning of many previous lives or even this life, we may have experiences that give us negative things. But the scriptures does give instruction. You have a woman's psychophysical nature and you do that. But that does not mean Prabhupada clearly mentions that women are like children. Um, they are not meant to be controlled by the husband, the son, or the um, by the father, but they are to be protected. It's not that they control. So one may go on on a debate going on about it, but there is a proper understanding of these Vanashrama system, women's rights, or following the husband. Everything is clearly mentioned in the scriptures. So we need to see according to how Prabhupada wanted to be followed. And yes, because we are in Kali Yuga, there's distortions and people take advantage and misuse it. But Prabhupada has given clear guidelines. Hare Krishna Shri Bhagavatam Ki Jai Shri Bhagavad Ki Jai Anandamu